Would you like to be part of a vibrant church in the midst of beautiful, awe-inspiring surroundings? Christ Faith Tabernacle at the CFT Cathedral Woolwich is now open for all. Apostle Alfred Williams, apostolic leader to churches around the globe, warmly invites you to come and be part of this incredible move of God. Every Sunday at 10 a.m., 186 Power Street, Woolwich, London. In our beautiful, recently refurbished cathedral, we are seeing miracles happen, people healed, needs are met, lives are transformed. The Word of God is preached with power through Apostle Alfred Williams. I want you to know this, that there is a God in heaven who has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and by Him, anyone who believes in Him, carry the very authority of God which, with which He created the heavens and the earth. Jesus said, freely you receive and freely give. I want to say this to you, stop going around to people, kneel down where you are, talk to the God who created the heavens and the earth in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and you will receive your miracle now. And be sure not to miss our two life-changing events, Overcomers Night Vigil, Hear the Voice of God, Receive Life-Changing Teaching, Be Lifted Through Dynamic Worship. Become an Overcomer on the last Friday of every month at 7 p.m. And also come and celebrate with us at our exciting monthly Victory Nights. Receive your breakthrough, be empowered to win. Come and claim your victory on the first, second and third day of every month. Whatever age, nationality or background you are from, there is something very special for you at the Christ Faith Tabernacle Cathedral Woolwich. Every Sunday at 10 a.m., 186 Power Street, Woolwich, London, SE18 6NL. Something happened when I came back from my trip. I think when I came back from my, when I was going to Birmingham two weeks ago, you know, I had a discussion with uh, somebody and the discussion touched my heart because for three months in this church, I've been preparing you for this discussion. The reason being that though I'm your presiding bishop and um, the general overseer of this church. At the same time, too, I went in about five years ago to study LLB. And my area of major in my studies was European Union law. And currently, I've been studying in Liverpool, University of Liverpool, an LLM program in international business law and corporate governance. 
of which haven't looked at international laws and treaties and business and, you know, across the globe, we zeroed in into the European Union. And that has exposed me a lot to what is European Union, what are the benefits both to the, to the people who are part of it and to the church. Now, in my wildest thought, I've been addressing this house, but then suddenly, you know, someone uh, spoke with me, you know, phoned me and we're talking, and I saw that we have the same understanding and the same spirit. And a time like this in a nation like ours, it is very, very necessary for people to know truth, not fiction. Because we're about to take a decision that will make or break this country. And when we say decision that will make or break us, we mean you and I. And so I decided that it would be ideal for me at this time to invite this um, great women of God. We expected a man too here, but he's not able to make it because he has to go somewhere. We have a, a, the company tonight of two eminent among us, Helen Grant and June Sapong. Now, I want us to welcome to the podium our MP, Helen Grant, conservative member of Maidstone. Please put your hands together for Helen Grant. Well, hello everyone, and um, thank you so much, Apostle Williams, for inviting us to this uh, amazing building. Uh, I must say, I, I feel um, it feels pretty humbling as a Christian standing before you and, uh, and having the opportunity to talk uh, this evening. I'm here tonight, there should have been four of us, but there's only two of us, but I'm here tonight with uh, a wonderful lady called June Sarpong, MBE. She's a TV presenter and broadcaster. And hopefully, between us, we will be able to help to make the case for why you should all, those of you that are old enough anyway, vote to remain in the EU on the 23rd of June. At the moment, the big problem for me with the referendum is that there are so many facts, figures, statistics, charts being banded around by both of the teams. And it's so difficult for everyone to decide who to believe and who not to believe. Most of the people that I speak to actually understand that Everything pretty much is arguable, and nothing very much is provable. But even that situation is made even worse, because both of the sides have become completely polarized in their views. So tonight, I'm not going to do the facts, figures, stats, bar charts. I'm not going to do that. And the four points that I will make to you this evening are of a much more personal nature. The first point, number one, racism and discrimination exist. Sadly, to many people all over the place, those two things are completely and utterly invisible. They're often regarded as an American thing or an American problem or people just being too sensitive. But that's not right because it does exist. We know it exists. And I suspect that there are many people in this room, including me, who have been on the receiving end of it. So people must recognize that and together we must resolve to deal with it. The EU, in my opinion, has a really important role to play in that process. Fighting discrimination, 
promoting equality. Legally, it has a very strong set of race equality directives and employment equality directives to fall back on. I also think, at the moment, the EU institutions are ready to flex their muscles a bit more and deal with discriminating non-compliant member states. At present, and it's a huge worry to me, we're seeing the rise of right-wing parties in countries strangely like Austria, like France, like Germany. And you know something, there's going to be more. And I'm in no doubt whatsoever that we'll need the power and the strength of the EU as an important check and balance. And I think it's vital as well that our country, the United Kingdom, with our marvellous multiculture, are a part of that response and that process. Number two, remaining in Europe with free movement means that it is less likely that people from a minority background will grow up in isolation, as I did. I grew up in the far northern city of Carlisle in the 60s and 70s, and I'm afraid I'm showing my age now, but it was the 60s and 70s. And you know, for, for a while, I was the only person in the whole of that city with a darker skin. And of course, that brought with it a number of issues. Young people need togetherness. They need commonality. But they also need to learn from a very early age to celebrate and to enjoy difference, different cultures, internationalism. Number three, being in Europe doesn't diminish our relationship with the Commonwealth, as the Brexiteers say. It actually amplifies it. Britain's trade with the Commonwealth is flourishing and it will continue to flourish. Also, being in the EU helps us to support the country. Many of us still have families there and we can do that in all sorts of different ways. Whether it's fighting bans on the import of mangoes to India or ensuring that restrictions on trade are relaxed with countries like Jamaica. The EU is also the world's biggest donor of aid. And being in the EU allows us to influence the direction of that spend to many African countries. And all of that money is, is used to do things like fighting poverty, protecting women and girls, and making sure that all of our children have universal primary education. My final point tonight is to do with uncertainty. The uncertainty of what will actually happen when we leave the EU. To me, leaving the EU is a massive leap in the dark. And we'd be doing it at a time that's awful, a time where our country is changing and dangerous things are happening. We have Putin in the East, we have Daesh in the Middle East, and we've got North Korea in the Far East. So is this really the time to divide? And what will actually happen if we do? Please vote on the 23rd of June. It's your democratic right to vote. It's empowering to vote. And it can make a difference. If we do it together, I promise you, it can make a difference. If you're not registered to vote, please do it. You have until the 7th of June. And if anyone doesn't know what to do, please come and see me afterwards. There's a website called Operation Black Vote. And if you go onto their website, they explain it very, very clearly what to do. It's very easy. Thank you once again, Apostle Williams, for inviting us in tonight. Thank you so much for listening. And I think it's over to my colleague, June.
Um, well, what can I say? Um, I am so uh, excited uh, to be part of the Stronger In board, which is the official um, campaign to help keep Britain in the EU. And the reason I decided to join that board was I thought it was very important uh, that the voice of um, uh, BME people, black people, ethnic people, uh, women, young people, though I'm not young anymore, though I like to pretend, um, <laughs> be heard. Because as we've seen with this campaign, there hasn't been much diversity, which is why it's so exciting to be here tonight alongside Helen, because it's so important that our voices be heard. This is, without a doubt, probably the most important vote of a lifetime. Whatever the decision is on June 23rd, we're not going to get that chance again. And I really wanted to sort of lay out why I think that as uh, members of the BME community and as immigrants and children of immigrants in this country, it's really important that we vote to stay in. When it comes to diversity, as we know, Britain is not perfect at all. All of us here have experienced prejudice and racism at some point in our lives. We know that the playing field is not level when it comes to work. We know particularly in relation to our men. But where we compare this to the rest of Europe, we are way ahead. And it's so important that we make sure that Britain remains in Europe and has a leadership role in Europe so that we also show in terms of how diversity is working and as a way we are then safeguarding the future of other BME communities within the rest of Europe. Now on June the 23rd, we have the chance to make sure that our voices are heard because it's funny when I sit in the board meetings and I see the polling, this is a vote that's really gonna be decided by groups that are often overlooked. So it's so important that we show that actually when you speak to communities that have been often overlooked by politicians, they will come out and be heard. And again, following on from that, then we make it clear what's needed. Because the minute politicians see that actually this is an electorate that will exercise their vote, they then have to start changing policies. We then have to start looking at policies that are much more inclusive and encourage or even force companies to be much more diverse. So there are three reasons that I think we need to stay in Europe. In a world full of superpowers and big trading blocks, I want to be part of a bigger union of like-minded people. And let's not forget that the EU, we have been a member of the EU for almost 50 years. That's 50 years of deal making and the other side will make it seem as if those deals have been terrible. But there are so many safeguards that we take for granted that are European law. Whether that be workers' rights, whether that be laws in terms of discrimination, and particularly for women. If you are a woman that is considering having a baby within the next five years, you should be very afraid if we leave the EU. Because maternity cover and the fact that you are guaranteed a minimum of 14 weeks maternity pay, that is European law. Now, of course, if we left the EU, yes, this would be dealt with, but it would not be the priority. So who knows how long that would take to become British law. And as, if we, as we've seen with the living wage, when you give companies and you give multinationals a chance to play with the law, they will. Also, I just want to end by saying, so often we as people of color are overlooked. So often we are ignored. And this is a time for us to be heard. And I really hope that you will all register. So if you are not registered to vote, it's important you register by June the 7th. Because if you don't register by that date, you cannot vote. So number one, first thing, if you're not registered, make sure you get registered. And as Helen said, if you go to Operation Black Vote, you can get all the information there. And then June the 23rd, let's come out in big numbers. Let's vote to stay in. Um, 
And uh, all I will say to that is I will be praying that you all vote in on June the 23rd. So thank you very much for having me. Well, I'm not a politician, but I'm a church leader. I think as a church leader, I owe politically a duty to God's people, of which I will stand in judgment before God to give account. And because of that, I will look at this from the biblical angle. The jurisdiction of Christians is not limited by boundaries and geography. God created nations and he asked us to be nations minded. Of course, we know that in Psalm 24, it says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If you look at also the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when they asked Jesus that when will you restore back the kingdom to Israel, he said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, which is your location, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. So we understand by evidence of the scriptures that anything that will expand the jurisdiction of Christians can never come from the devil but God. Let me read this to you. Let me just share this with you. If you look at the, the book of Acts 13, it tells us the story of the first missionary journey. And that scripture says that while, you know, uh, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers and, and they were, while they were fasting and worshiping, the Holy Spirit says, separate for me Paul and Barnabas for the job or for the work that I have assigned them. Verse 4 says, after they have fasted, they prayed and lay hands on them and sent them. And they moved from nation to nation, preaching the gospel. Now, the only thing that I believe in relevance to this is this. We British, being part of EU, it removes the border. The first advantage to the church is the first privilege for you and I who are God's people to be able to go to any part of Europe and evangelize these nations without any hindrance since we became member of eu some of us have been utilizing that some of us have branches now in italy in germany in berlin in holland you know all over the whole place not only that since we started or well, since britain became part of eu some of us christians and churches have put investments into those countries and we were able to do those things because we were treated as part of the nationals of those countries. All right? Now, the fact is this. The church of God in England have not maximized this potential. Because as I'm speaking now, if I ask from church leaders in England, I'm sure that if 10% of us have exploited that opportunity, that would be by God. And I believe very much that this time that we are coming into in the age of time is a time that the heartbeat of every Christian is how to reach out to the lost. And the time that the church of God began to grasp the understanding that, look, if you say that I am a British, what that means is that I'm a European. It means that I can just get out of this place and move to Germany and set up there. I will be taken as a German and I have all the privileges and legal rights of a German. If I move from Germany to France, I have all the legal rights of a French. If I decide to go to Italy and move to Holland, I have nothing to hinder me. This season is the season that the church of God in the majority are just waking up to the consciousness. And is this the right season to shut the door? God does not open a door only to shut it without realizing his purpose. Let me say this to you. If we look at, I was checking this out 
recently, when I began to move from London to Germany and other parts of Europe, I discovered that the black race in, you know, let's say the black race outside Britain, it looked to me that they were sleeping. You know why I said that? Because in England, we have a lot of black people in the parliament, a reasonable number of black mayors and black, um, you know, councillor. Now the mayor of London is a black man. But in Germany, it's not so. Germany just produced their first two black MPs. And you know, when I got to Germany, I, I saw an inscription in Germany of black people coming to Germany, the first medical doctor who came from, who, who was an African in Germany, was a medical doctor eating something. And I saw a lot of Germans who are blacks, all right, who have lived third generation there. But is it not interesting that despite the fact that there are many, haven't seen us in England rising to the top, they are just waking up to such. And now the two black folks we have in the parliament in Germany are Karabi and uh, Karabi Diaby and Charles Humber. We need more blacks in the parliament. And currently, we as a church are having a few number of things to do with German government. I will be visiting the parliament of Germany uh, on the 8th of this next month, June. The issues we have been looking at is how can the church affect the black community in Germany and help them as we have helped black community in this country. Now, if we pull out of Europe, what will happen to us on the night we pulled out? Number one, the door is shut. So all our investment that we have encouraged our members who have set up businesses in Europe, what will happen to those investments? They'll be treated as foreign investors and nobody has told us the tax imp implication of that yet some of our people have bought houses in europe they will become foreigners what about the tax implication of that a large number of uh, um you know uh, retirees have moved to settle in some part of europe haven't they settled completely in those regions they have to be deported that is a fact. Because if we deport all the Europeans in England, I'm sure that every English or British in every European country will be sent back home. So we have quite a lot of complications that will happen to the negative. For me, I believe that we who are Christians need to look very much into the spiritual aspect. I've had a few questions about whether we appoint the uh, members of parliament in Europe. Some, somebody said that we do not appoint them, they appoint themselves. I beg to differ. From my legal knowledge and my common knowledge, I recognize that we have MPs, members of parliament, that we were the ones who appointed them. Isn't it? And so and we have representation in the European court. We have representation everywhere from England. And right now, Britain is one of the frontline leaders or in the driving wheel of this operation. I believe that that is not true. But finally, I will say to us that the book of Romans 13, 1, it says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And what I want to talk about in that is that I believe, regardless of all philosophies or intuition of men, that European Union did not come by the decision of any man, but by God. And I talk as a theologian. Because this scripture tells me that all authority that is have been established by God. The King James Version says, has been ordained by God. And when God tells us that if there's any authority, he's the one who ordained it. 
I think God's people should look at how can we penetrate that authority? What is the benefit of God in that authority? What is the interest of the Father in that authority? How can that authority be of a benefit to God's children in this season and also reach out to the world? That is what believers ought to be looking into. And I want to say to you that even if Britain leave um, EU, of which we know that there will be no man in Britain who will not suffer severely economically and severely, you know, in the area of jurisdiction, limited seriously. The whole of Africa is coming together. No one can stop it. America is talking of extending their reach down south. No one can stop it. The Asians have come together and formed their own bank, World Bank now, by Asian people. No one can stop it. And I tell you, more countries in Europe will join the EEC. And can Britain survive alone? My answer from my layman's knowledge and intellectual knowledge is no. So I will say this to you all, therefore, go out on the 23rd and make sure you vote. Can I say also to us, we don't only vote in this situation, we must vote every time for the government that are elected. When Christians withdraw, then anybody who is appointed there, we have to make laws over us. And the church of God have withdrawn a lot. It matters like this as if we are unconcerned. We pray and pray and pray. When it's time to act, we fold our hands and then evil prevail. We say no to that from this time. I will stay in Europe because Europe has not been saved. I will stay in Europe so that I can go into Germany, I can go into um, um, Italy, into Berlin, into um, um, Holland, into Belgium, into France, and help our brothers there. I just came back from Belfast today. And I'll tell you this, uh, Brother Paul and I, with mommy, went to Belfast. You know what we went to do in Belfast? We went to hold meeting with ministers of Belfast to see how can we in London help Belfast, Northern Ireland. And one of them asked me, what is your view about Northern Ireland? I said, bombing. Yes, that is what many of us think. When you say, no, when you say Northern Ireland, what do you think? Is it not bomb? I'm being frank here. Because all what is shown us on television is somebody bombs somebody, somebody shoots somebody and stop. But then the, the man replied to me and said there are many good things in Northern Ireland. God's children are here. And I was taken to the parliament of Northern Ireland and I met the Christian minister who gathers all other ministers and the whole prayer in the parliament as we do in London right now. They are doing that in Germany every month. Now Germany has gone, be, um, sorry, Belfast has gone beyond that and they started having meetings in various local governments and the meeting brought everybody, Sinn Féin and all others, everybody come to the prayer meeting and since they started that prayer, there is peace in, in Ireland and then I was told by the, one of the fathers in, in um, Belfast he said to me, Apostle, I want you to go with me to Italy. There's a great revival happening in Italy. There's a great revival happening in Germany. Germany just had a, a, a meeting, a, you know, an international meeting of 25,000 people. And he told me about a church in, Germ in Italy. There are about 3,000, I think, yeah, about, about 5,000 the congregation is. And they have ministers network that they are praying seriously for revival in Italy. And I said to him, no, no problem. I will go back to London. I will speak to ministers in London. We will all go to join them in Italy. And we will go to join them in Germany. And we will go to join them in other parts of Europe. Then if that is the word of God and that is what we want to do, why should it all be shot against us? Because if we are out of Europe, you and I will have to kill for visa. And let me say this to you. They will turn you down. I am not praying. I am telling you the truth. <laughs> Hallelujah. The moment you appear there, they will turn you down. Because sometimes now, even when we bring our bread passport, sometimes the look they give us, we ignore it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make all thy enemies 
the full soul of thy faith. Go out and register. Go out and vote. It is beneficial for the kingdom of God. God bless you. Would you like to be part of a vibrant church in the midst of beautiful, awe-inspiring surroundings? Christ Faith Tabernacle at the CFT Cathedral Woolwich is now open for all. Apostle Alfred Williams, apostolic leader to churches around the globe, warmly invites you to come and be part of this incredible move of God. Every Sunday at 10 a.m., 186 Power Street, Woolwich, London. In our beautiful, recently refurbished cathedral, we are seeing miracles happen, people healed, needs are met, lives are transformed. The Word of God is preached with power through Apostle Alfred Williams. I wanted to know this, that there is a God in heaven who has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and by Him, anyone who believes in Him, carry the very authority of God which, with which He created the heavens and the earth. Jesus said, freely you receive and freely give. I want to say this to you, Stop going around to people. Kneel down where you are. Talk to the God who created the heavens and the earth in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and you will receive your miracle now. And be sure not to miss our two life-changing events. Overcomers Night Vigil. Hear the voice of God. Receive life-changing teaching. Be lifted through dynamic worship. Become an overcomer on the last Friday of every month at 7 p.m. And also come and celebrate with us at our exciting monthly victory nights. Receive your breakthrough. Be empowered to win. Come and claim your victory on the first, second, and third day of every month. Whatever age, nationality, or background you are from, there is something very special for you at the Christ Faith Tabernacle Cathedral Woolwich every Sunday at 10 a.m., 186 Power Street, Woolwich, London, SE18 6NL.